Hello AP Calc AP students, Mr. Record here taking a look at our first video that covers topic 6.4 and it is a big one. Not so much the example, but the ideas that you're going to learn in 6.4 will permeate throughout the rest of the course, I promise. Every single thing that we talk about will all be related back to this, the idea of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it's also going to play a big part on the AP exam. But the cool thing about it, it's not that difficult to understand. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first page of your notes, which I know contain quite a bit of information. And you'll see that the notes do combine topics 6, 4, and 6, 5 only because of the fact that they both have this common language about the accumulation function, which is going to come into play even in this very first video that you're going to see. So what is the fundamental theorem of calculus? Well, it happens to have two parts. Depending on what textbook you use, it's possible that these could be flip-flopped, part one and part two, so it really doesn't matter which is which. But I want to tell you that we're going to actually use the part one a little bit in our example in this video. And that's simply if you've got a function that's continuous on the closed interval a to b, and you define some brand new function g of x to be the integral of that function. Well, I want you to know that we actually refer to this very often as an accumulator function. Because we're accumulating things. What are we accumulating? Well, as x might get farther and farther from this a value, we're accumulating area under a curve because that's what the integration of a function is with boundaries. We've already talked about that a great deal. At times, we might be interested in taking the derivative of this accumulator function. So take g prime and you would get, well, the derivative of f with an integral is basically going to cancel away the integral because derivatives and integrals are opposite operations. And then you would just be left with a plain old f. And we would evaluate it at that upper boundary. Now we'll talk more about the oh, variations that you might be faced with when you take that derivative as they get more complicated throughout the remaining topics. The part two of the fundamental theorem calculus is setting up our shortcut that we're going to be able to use to find area later on. If we want to integrate little f from a to b, there is a function capital F that exists that will be that result and thus will allow us to input our boundaries and subtract. The relationship between capital F and little f is as such. The derivative of this capital F is going to be the same as that result there. I will talk about the net change theorem a little bit later as it plays a role more so in our examples that are coming up. But in a nutshell, if you look very closely, all the net change theorem is, is getting this f of b all by itself and adding the f of a. So let's take a look at our example one. We've got a function f. Its graph consists of two straight line segments, one here and one here. It's kind of hard to see that horizontal one. And there are two quarter circles, and that's what you have here with this concave down curve and this concave up curve, two quarter circles. We're going to define g of x to be the integration of f of t from 0 to x. And we are going to start by finding g of 0. So when we do this, we know that g of 0 is just simply what we get when we let the x be 0 in this entire function. So you're integrating from 0 to 0, which kind of seems odd. What the heck do you get when you integrate from 0 to 0? It's like there is no area that's going to transpire because there's no width of your shape. And because of that, your answer will be 0, which is probably what you were thinking. Bottom line, everyone, is if your upper and lower boundary of a definite integral are the same, you will get zero every time. It doesn't matter what you're taking the integration of. Now for part two here, we actually have something that's a little bit more substantial because our upper boundary is a one and we are basically being asked to take the area 
from 0 to 1 underneath this graph of f. And so if I shade that in, we clearly see that that is a triangle, which is great because we have geometric formulas that will take care of that for us. And those that formula that I speak of is just 1 half base times height, or 1 half 1 times 2, which is 1. And that is kind of where we end that part 2. Now if I move on to part 3, if we let x be 2, we're now saying let's integrate from 0 to 2 of f of t dt. Now, there's a special way that I would like to teach this. And we'll see how you react here in just a moment. But if you integrate from 0 to 2, then obviously I need to add a bit more area here. Or can I say we are accumulating, there we go, a bit more area. And I realize that you could just go back and, and figure out what this area is from the beginning uh, using the formula for the area of a trapezoid, which you're probably getting pretty good at. But the way I want you to think about this is like this. Pick up where you left off at your previous answer, 1. That's where this dashed gray line is. And then think about adding another integral, starting at 1, ending at 2 of this f of 2. And that is actually going to be this net change theorem that we're going to get into more and more. That net change theorem, if you flip back to this previous page, just talks about what is your ending amount if you know your starting amount plus your net change. And lo and behold, we can think of this as our starting amount plus our net change. Now, 1 to 2 is certainly going to be a rectangle of 2 by 1. And so we would end up with 3 as our total area at that stage. Pretty much, we're going to subscribe to the same belief. For the integration from 0 to 4 of f of t with respect to t, we're going to first of all think about ending at 2, where we knew we had an area of 3. Okay, And then we are going to add to that the definite integral, picking up where we left off at 2 and heading up to 4. All right, we're skipping over 3 as it was not uh, a one of our individual problems to find g of 3. So what do we have? Well, if we do our shading from 2 to 4, it looks like we finally have this quarter circle that we talked about. So we have to add this area of the quarter circle. This quarter circle has a radius of 2. And so we think of 3 plus 1 fourth pi and the radius 2 squared is going to give us a 4, which essentially means these 4s will cancel, and we have 3 plus pi. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to circle that answer so it doesn't get lost, and I'll just do the same thing for our previous parts that we've already completed. All right. Looks like we have one more that we're going to evaluate g for. g of 3 is going to be the integration from 0 to 6, of course, of f of t. Can't really draw anything with my gray pen, but I do realize that we did end up at 3 plus pi. It's just that now we're going to accumulate some more space all the way to 6. I always like to draw in my shaded regions in a different color, this magenta color, if they happen to lie underneath the x-axis because that's going to be a reminder that they're treated as negative. We have positive space up here, but this negative space down there. And so essentially what we're going to do is subtract the area that would be the same 1 fourth pi r squared, which just means we're subtracting that pi that we added in the previous part, and then we're going to get positive 3 back again. So I think that gives you enough practice in dealing with how to evaluate the function g at a given x, now you're going to evaluate g prime. So this is where you're going to use that fundamental theorem part one in your notes. In your notes, it's a part one. So if you take the derivative of g, that means that you essentially wipe out this integral symbol and you would just simply get the function f. 
And because we're going to take that derivative evaluated at 1, that x value is 1. And you should probably realize that this is a lot easier because you just simply go to the function f, find 1, see the y value up there at 2, and you are finished. There's no area that you have to find. It's interesting that finding the derivative is a lot easier than finding the value of the function. For g prime of 4, the same thing is going to happen. But at that stage, we see that we're equal to f of 4, and that gives us a 0. And then for g prime of 6, that's going to be the same as f of 6, which from our graph has the y value at negative 2. So you could do those all day long. Now for part b, and it finishes up by asking us to sketch a possible graph of g in this coordinate plane. And it even asks us to find the values of g double prime as a hint. That's kind of interesting. Let's think about what that means here in a little bit. Well, initially, you have a lot of good information to go by. You actually have a table of values consisting of five numbers. If you think about it, you have x is 0, g is 0. So you could actually start plotting ordered pairs because this is, after all, a graph of g. When x is 1, g of 1 is 1. When x is 2, g is 3. When x is 4, g is, okay, 3 plus pi. That's a little tougher. 3 plus approximately 3.14 would be about a smidge bigger than, than 6. So we could maybe put that right about here. And then we'll do the uh, g of 6 is 3. That's going to take us back down to here. Now, as we connect these dots, what we would think about doing is assessing whether or not we're going to connect them with straight lines. Because I don't know if we really want to do that. And I know it says to find values of g double prime and think, well, what does that really mean? Well, if g prime is equal to f of x, and that is true by our fundamental theorem part one that we talked about, then what do you think g double prime would be equal to? Well, we would just take the derivative of the right side and get f prime. If we go back up and we take a look at this graph of f, we find out that f prime is the derivative of it, which has a, a positive value between 0 and 1, which essentially means that from 0 to 1, we're going to graph something that should be concave up. Because if you recall, whenever the second derivative is greater than 0, the graph is con up. But something interesting is happening between 1 and 2. In 1 and 2, we have the second derivative that's actually equal to 0, right? If g double prime is the same as f single prime, f single prime is the slope of this tangent line. So what that means is that these two points would be connected with a straight line. From this stage on, everything that we see on this graph from a derivative perspective, all of those points, are going to have a negative value as far as their slope is concerned. So f prime is negative, which means g double prime is negative, and therefore we're concave down. It seems pretty intuitive that you have to be increasing and then decreasing. So it's an interesting little fact that we're just going to have this straight section right there based on that behavior. And you will see lots of problems on the AP exam where you work with this kind of information. And you've got a lot of them coming up in the in mostly in the in the skill builder questions that you're going to work on. Hope this makes a lot of sense. It opens the door for you to do a lot of really cool things in Topic 6.4 and the rest of the way out. Thanks for joining. Please stick around for our future videos. We'll see you next time.